This is part two of the lecture on the design of a steel bridge. For the prerequisite content, please review part one of the lecture. The link is provided in the video description field. In part one of the lecture, we calculated the maximum tensile and compressive forces in a truss structure supporting a railroad bridge. Two types of loads were considered, dead load and live load. Please review part one of the lecture before proceeding with this presentation. Here is a summary of the analysis from the first part of the lecture. The bottom chord members are in tension. The maximum tensile force in these members is 397 kips. The top chord members are in compression with a maximum force of 525 kips. These two vertical members are subjected to a maximum tensile force of 259 kips. Since CG is a zero force member, we will omit it from this discussion. The outer diagonal members carry a maximum compressive force of 523 kips. And the inner diagonal members could be subjected to a maximum tensile force of 240 kips or a maximum compressive force of 22 kips. So, CF and CH need to be designed to withstand both tensile and compressive forces. Using A992 steel, we want to select a standard W section for each member group. Let's start with the design of the bottom chord members. The length of each member along the bottom cord of the truss, is 20 feet. The design tension force is 397 kips. For tension member design, we need to consider four design criteria. Yielding of the gross section. Rupture of the net section. Block shear. And slenderness ratio. These topics were discussed in lectures SD1 through SD5. F sub Y is 50 KSI, and F sub U is 65 KSI. I will use this criterion to determine the required cross-sectional area of the member. I will then select a few members that meet the area requirement. And, I will check the remaining criteria for each selected section, until the right section is identified. We know that the yield strength of the section must exceed the factored axial force in the member. Here, phi, the strength reduction factor, is 0.9. Since F sub Y is 50, and the factored tension force in the member is 397 kips, we get a minimum required gross area of 8.82 square inches. So, we need to select standard W sections with a gross area of at least 8.82. Here are three candidate W sections. All three sections satisfy the yielding of the gross area condition. Let's see if they also satisfy the other criteria. Here are the key dimensions of the three selected sections. Suppose each bottom cord member is connected to its adjacent members using a series of bolts. The top and bottom flanges and the web participate in the connection. There are two rows of bolts in each flange and three rows of bolts in the web. There are three bolts per row. The diameter of each bolt is three quarters of an inch. The key bolt spacings are given. The rupture of the net section limit state can be checked using this equation. Here, the strength reduction factor is 0.75. The effective area, A sub E, equals the net area of the cross section, times the shear lag factor. Since all the cross section elements participate in the connection, the shear lag factor equals 1. To determine the net area, we need to know the hole diameter. The hole diameter equals the bolt diameter, plus 2 one of an inch. 
One sixteenth of an inch is added to the bolt diameter for the size of the actual hole being punched. Another one sixteenth of an inch is added for possible damage done to the perimeter of the hole while punching it. Since there are four holes in the flanges across a typical cross section at the connection, we need to subtract four times the flange thickness, times the hole diameter, from the area of the cross section to account for the presence of the holes. Similarly, we need to subtract three times the web thickness times the hole diameter, from the gross area of the cross section, to account for the holes in the web. So, the net area of the cross section equals the gross area minus these two area reductions. The net area equals 6.27 square inches. Since the shear lag factor is 1, we get an effective area of 6.27 for the section. Now we are ready to check the limit state equation. Since the rupture strength is less than the factored axial force in the member, we must conclude that the section lacks sufficient strength to carry the load effectively. Let's try the next section down the list. Using a new section, results in a few changes on this sheet. Flange thickness, web thickness, and the gross area of the cross section change. The updated calculations become. As you can see, the rupture strength of the section is greater than tensile force in the member. So, W16 by 31 satisfies the rupture limit state. Let's see if this section also satisfies the block shear limit state. The block shear strength of the section must exceed the design tensile force in the member. The tensile force may cause the corner of a flange to tear off like this. Or, it could cause the web plate to tear off as shown here. Using this equation, we can determine the strength of each flange corner and the web against block shear failure. For the flange corner, we can identify three areas. Gross shear area. This area equals distance A times the thickness of the flange. Net shear area. This is the same as the gross shear area minus the area due to the holes along the shear path. And net tension area, which is the area of the flange plate along this path. Using these values, we can determine the nominal block shear strength for each corner of the flange. This expression simplifies to. So, the block shear strength for each flange corner is 124 kips. We can perform similar calculations for the web. The gross shear area for the web is the area along these two equal length paths. And, the net shear area equals the gross shear area, minus, the area due to the holes along the shear path. The net tension area for the web is the area along this path. The nominal block shear strength for the web can be expressed as or Since there are four flange corners at each end of the member, the total nominal block shear strength equals. Therefore, the design block shear strength for W16 by 36 equals 495.75 kips. Since this value is greater than the tensile force in the member, we can conclude that the section has adequate strength for resisting block shear failure. Let's see if W16 by 36 satisfies the slenderness ratio condition. The length of each bottom cord member is 240 inches. The radii of gyration for W16 by 36 are. The smaller value controls the design. According to the AISC specification, unbraced length of the member, divided by the governing radius of gyration, should not exceed 300. In this case, L over R, is less than 300. Since this, 
and the other design conditions have been met. We can use W16 by 36 for the bottom cord members of the truss. Now let's turn our attention to the design of the vertical members. Using the yielding of the gross section limit state, we can determine the minimum required cross-sectional area for the member. So, the section must have a cross-sectional area of at least 5.76 square inches. Let's select two standard sections that meet this requirement. I am going to select W6 by 20, which has an area close to the minimum required area. And a section with a larger area, which should offer a higher rupture strength in case W6 by 20 fails in rupture. Let's check the rupture strength of W6 by 20. I am going to use the same connection arrangement as before. To determine the rupture strength of the section, we need to determine the effective net area. Since we are using the same connection configuration for all the members, the shear lag factor and bolt hole diameter remain the same throughout the process. The flange thickness for W6 by 20 is 0.365 inches, so we get an area reduction of 1.28 square inches due to the holes in the two flanges at a typical cross section at the connection. The area reduction due to the three holes in the web equals 0.68 inches. So, the net area of the cross section is 3.91 square inches. This results in an effective area of 3.91. The rupture strength for the section, therefore, equals 191 kips. Since this is less than the tensile force in the member, we must conclude that W6 by 20 does not offer adequate rupture strength for the member. So, we need to use a stronger section. Let's try W14 by 26. This part of the solution process remains the same. Flange thickness gets updated, resulting in a change in the flange reduction area. Similarly, the change in the web thickness affects the reduction area for the web. And, the change in the gross area updates the net area. These changes result in an updated effective area of 5.55 square inches, yielding a rupture strength of 271 kips for the member. So, W14 by 26 has adequate rupture strength. Now we need to check the section's block shear strength. To check the block shear strength of W14 by 26, we need the block shear strength of the cross-sectional elements. Each flange corner has a block shear strength of 108 kips. The web of the section has a block shear strength of 143 kips. Therefore, the total nominal block shear strength at the connection is 575 kips. This leads to a design block shear strength of 431.25 kips. So, W14 by 26 offers adequate strength against block shear failure. To check the member's slenderness ratio, we will use the smaller radius of gyration, 1.08. Since the length of the vertical members equals 204 inches, the slenderness ratio equals 189, which is less than the upper limit value. So, standard section W14 by 26 meets the design requirements for the vertical members. Let's turn our attention to the design of the inner diagonal members. Since they are subjected to both tensile and compressive forces, the inner diagonal members must be designed as tension and compression members. First, we select a standard section that can satisfy the tension design requirements. 
We just showed that W14 by 26 offers adequate strength against yielding of the gross section, rupturing of the net section, and block shear, for a tension member subjected to a maximum axial force of 259 kips. Since these diagonal members are expected to carry a smaller axial force, the same section also works here. We only need to check the slenderness ratio for the diagonals, since they are longer, than the vertical members. Each diagonal member has a length of 315 inches. The governing radius of gyration for W14 by 26 is 1.08 inches. Since the slenderness ratio for the member does not exceed the upper limit value, we can use W14 by 26 for the tension member design of the diagonals. Let's see if W14 by 26 also satisfies the requirements for compression member design. In previous lectures, we discussed flexural buckling as the main mode of failure in compression members. The buckling limit state can be expressed as where F sub CR is the critical buckling stress. For our member, this equation becomes the critical buckling stress can be determined using AISC, equations E32 and E33. F sub E equals KL over R is the governing slenderness ratio for the member. Since truss elements are assumed to be pin connected at their ends, we can take effective length factors, Kx, and Ky, as one. Therefore, the weaker direction controls the buckling of the member. This means, we need to calculate the critical buckling stress using the properties of the section about the y-axis. We also need to check for local buckling. If local buckling controls, we need to update the calculated critical buckling stress accordingly. The details of this process were previously explained in lectures SD6 and SD9. Let's go ahead and calculate the buckling strength of the inner diagonal members for W14 by 26 section. The slenderness ratio for the member is 291.67. So, F sub E equals 3.36 KSI. To determine which equation should be used to calculate F sub CR, we need to know this limiting value. It equals 113.43. Since KL over R is greater than 113.43, we need to use this equation. So, the critical buckling stress equals 2.95 KSI. Now we can determine the buckling strength of the member. It equals 20.42 kips. Since this is less than the compressive force in the member, we must conclude that W14 by 26 does not offer sufficient buckling strength for the member. We need to select another section. Let's try W12 by 40. Given the larger cross-sectional area and radius of gyration, the section should provide adequate strength against buckling. The effective slenderness ratio of the member is resulting in F sub E of 10.86 KSI. We still need to use this equation to determine the critical buckling stress. So, F sub CR equals 9.52 KSI. Therefore, the design buckling strength of the member is 100.25 kips. W12 by 40 has sufficient overall buckling strength. Let's check for local buckling. To determine if local buckling controls the design, we need to check the width to thickness ratio of the flange, and the web of the section. This ratio, referred to as lambda, for the flange of W12 by 40 is 7.77. The limiting value for lambda, referred to as lambda r, given by this expression, is equal to 13.49.
Since lambda is less than lambda r, the flange of the section is considered a non-slender element. Meaning, the flange plate is not susceptible to local buckling. Therefore, there is no need to reduce the already calculated buckling strength of the member. We also need to check the web plate for local buckling. Lambda for web equals 33.6 and lambda r equals 35.88. So, the web plate is also a non-slender member. Therefore, the buckling strength of the member remains to be 100.25 kips. W12 by 40 has adequate compressive strength for the inner diagonal members. Now we need to check the tensile strength of the section. You can go ahead and repeat the tension member design calculations for W12 by 40. Here is a summary of the calculations. W12 by 40 has adequate yield strength. The section's fracture strength is adequate. Its block shear strength is adequate. And, its slenderness ratio meets the requirement. So, the section meets all the tension and compression design requirements. That means we can use W12 by 40 for the inner diagonal members. The outer diagonal members need to be designed as compression members. Their strength must be greater than the maximum compressive force that develops in these members. Let's start the design process by assuming inelastic behavior for the outer diagonal members. This assumption allows us to use this equation for determining the member's critical buckling stress. The use of this equation requires that the member's effective slenderness ratio satisfies this condition. So, we can use this expression to determine the minimum required radius of gyration for the section. To play it safe, we can select a section that has a radius of gyration of at least 3 inches. So, using 3 for R, we can calculate F sub E, hence, the critical buckling stress in the member. Substituting this value for F sub C R, in this equation, we get. So, the section for the member, needs to have a radius of gyration of around 3, and a gross area of around 26. Let's use these estimates to select a few sections from the AISC manual. W12 by 96 is a good candidate. W12 by 87 may also work, since its area is close to 26 square inches. Since W12 by 87 is a lighter section, let's try it first. We want to check and see if the section offers adequate buckling strength. Using 3.08 for R, we get 27.36 for F sub E, which gives us a critical buckling stress of 23.27 KSI. Using this value for F sub C R, we can determine the design strength of the section. It equals 536 kips. So yes, W12 by 87 has sufficient overall buckling strength. Let's see if local buckling could be an issue for this section. For W12 by 87, lambda for the flange is 7.48. This value is less than the limit value of 13.49. So, local buckling of the flange is not a controlling factor. Lambda for the web is 18.9. Since this value does not exceed the value for lambda r, we know that web buckling is not a controlling factor either. Since local buckling does not control the design, we can conclude that the buckling strength of the member remains at 536 kips, which exceeds the factored compression force. Therefore, W12 by 87 can be used for the outer diagonal members. The top cord members of the truss carry a maximum compression force of 525 kips. Since those members have a shorter length than the diagonal members, we can conclude that W12 by 87 provides sufficient compressive strength for those members as well. 
So, we can use W12 by 87 for both the outer diagonal and top chord members. To summarize the results, let's write the designation for each selected section next to the member on the truss diagram.